welcome to the fifth lecture and the final lecture in the autumn lecture series entitled Marble Hill Local to Global. If you've missed any of the previous talks, you can go to our Marble Hill YouTube channel and be able to see the four that have preceded this lecture this evening. The reason why we're here is because Marble Hill is being revived, which is a really exciting project with £8 million, £5 million of which is being invested by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and a further £3 million from English Heritage, the charity. That money will see the house being open, free for five days a week and reinterpreted, which is Dr Caroline Dixon, our speaker this evening, has been working really hard on with our interpretation team. It will see the landscape invested in and the biodiversity secured for future generations with some of those amazing heritage aspects brought back to life from grottos to groves. The sports facilities within the Marble Hill have been invested in and it's wonderful to see our pitches being renewed and this month we will start the work on our sports facility for changing so that it will mean that there's an accessible space and also a space for men and women to change independently. And we'll also have our lovely cafe. As you know, it is indeed open. And with every sip of coffee, you know that you can give back to the charity by doing so. So do please come and enjoy a wonderful panini or a coffee um, at Marble Hill and come and enjoy the new landscape that you'll see today. We're also doing a raft of different events. So do get involved. And this is uh, one of the events, uh, but there's everything from remembrance commemorations to carols at Christmas and wreath making. So please do get involved. And you can do that by going to the Marble Hill uh, website where there's lots of events on there. So it is with great delight that tonight I welcome to our virtual lecture room, um, Dr. Carol Ann Dixon. She's a cultural geographer and an education consultant with interests in African and Caribbean diaspora histories and heritage, museum geographies and contemporary visual arts. Her doctoral dissertation, The Othering, of Africa and its diasporas in Western museum practices was done at the University of Sheffield in 2016. And she examined the changing curatorial approaches to the display and interpretation of cultural objects from the African continent in contrasting museums and galleries settings throughout Western Europe. Dr. Karen Ann Dixon has been a very important part of one of our recent projects called From All Angles, in which she's been working with youth offenders to explore enslavement histories and also share about the amazing mahogany staircase and its history and craftsmanship and also the aspect of sustainability. And we can't wait for her to tell us a little bit more about that in as she joins us this evening. But just a little plug and hot off the press, uh, Dr. Caroline Dixon has just had a paper published this September in the September and October in museum journals. So please do get your copy. And I'm hoping that uh, Dr. Caroline Dixon will tell us a little bit more about that in her talk. So thank you so much for coming, Dr. Caroline Dixon. And we can't wait to hear more about the learning and teaching of enslavement histories. Thank you very much for that warm introduction, Rachel, and thank you to everyone for joining us, either here live at the event or also online at the YouTube channel. Earlier this year, in March 2021, I was commissioned to work on two projects for English Heritage. The first was a partnership initiative uh, with the University of Leicester and Culture and examining transatlantic slavery connections at six English heritage sites. And then the second one that Rachel was involved in was Marble Hill from all angles. So as Rachel has outlined, we ran three workshops for young people from a group called Project X, all about the history of the mahogany staircase exploring and uncovering links to enslavement history and the Atlantic world, alongside related themes about wood carving, deforestation and environmental sustainability. So in the presentation, 
I'm going to summarize some of the teaching and learning approaches and the creative learning activities that I developed in consultation with the project team, the young learner participants, and also the youth workers from Project X. So it was a collaboration, not just about me. And that collaboration involved a lot of pre-workshop activity. And an important element of that was interviewing the young men who participated on the course to find out what their preferred learning styles were. So I will talk a little bit about the content, the resources and the activities that we designed to suit their individual learning needs. And then also I will talk a little bit about some of the complexities and sensitivities around teaching and learning enslavement history in this heritage context. And so you will hear me reference anti-racism educational practices and decolonization throughout the presentation. It's always important for me to provide some background information about my own heritage and my identity and some of the values that inform how and why I pursue my work. So this is why I always include a slide like this at the start of each talk. I am a Caribbean diasporan, born in Sheffield to Jamaican parents, who migrated as part of the Windrush generation. So enslavement history is actually part of my own ancestry. Career-wise, I initially trained as a school teacher and I taught history and geography in secondary schools before retraining to work in the museums, libraries and archives sector and then pursuing a PhD. And as Rachel outlined, for my doctorate, I examined the cultural geographies of museums, galleries and the arts, specifically the othering of artwork and cultural objects that have African provenance in Western museumscapes. So as an education consultant and a postdoc, I've worked on a number of heritage related projects with a strong focus on enslavement and resistance histories. And these include, as you can see on the screen, Making Freedom, which was an exhibition and e-learning project led by the Windrush Foundation, commemorating emancipation in the Anglophone Caribbean and the fight for independence. And the other project that I've got on screen is called Freedom to Believe. This was a theatre in education project for young people all about Caribbean social and religious history. And it was developed at Edinburgh and Newcastle universities and run in partnership with Talawar Theatre Company. And for both of those projects, I wrote education packs, which are still available online today. I'm holding up the printed version of Freedom to Believe. Um, and if you Google the title Freedom to Believe Carol Dixon, you'll be able to download a free copy uh, from the web. And in these resource packs, these were the ones that I used to inform the work that I did at Marble Hill because it was only a project that lasted for three weeks. Importantly in Freedom to Believe, which lasted for much longer, at the back of this um, education pack are 10 pages of glossary. And in that glossary, it, can, it contains a lot of information about sensitive vocabulary for teaching and learning enslavement history. So please do feel free to go to my website or download the pack to find out more information that I can actually cover during this session itself. So every aspect of the work that I do is deeply rooted in anti-racist education practice and decolonial praxis. These foundations are based on critical analysis of interdisciplinary scholarship spanning the diversity of the Atlantic world, not only in print, but also through active collaboration with fellow educators and activists who are working to decolonize the academy, to decolonize curricula, and also knowledge production. So I'm showing you these book covers to illustrate that my research on Britain's involvement in enslavement and the wider context of empire and colonialism draws heavily from the expertise of fellow scholars of colour, including historians such as David Olashoga and Olivet Hotel, the work of black feminist geographers such as Caroline Bressy in the UK and also Catherine McKittrick in the North American context because she's a black Canadian geographer, and interdisciplinary luminaries such as Professor Hazel Carby. 
And I'm going to spotlight for you just three key reasons why that diversity of foundational knowledge is so important. So first of all, regarding the archive, W.E.B. Du Bois has discussed ways that identity and history are founded at least partially through representation. And he stated, quote, if one cannot or does not produce an archive, others will dictate the terms by which one will be represented and remembered. One will exist for the future in someone else's archive, end quote. So the racialized dynamics of archiving as a process and as a product has meant that for centuries, people of color had little to no control over what was documented about our lives and the lives of our ancestors. In Hazel Carby's book, Imperial Intimacies, she also notes that because much of the documentation about the slave trade and plantation economies was recorded for business and accounting purposes, this presents significant complexities of absence and erasure for those wishing to glean nuanced details about enslaved people's lived realities. And then secondly, imagery. Visual representations of enslaved people of color are largely limited to European artists' depictions. Some of that imagery is highly caricatured, stereotyped and distorted, reflecting the racist attitudes of that era. It was also the norm to see marginalized and dehumanized images based on positioning within figurative works, almost like a hierarchy. So true to life, single figure portraiture of individuals with African heritage was extremely rare. And what I'm showing you in the center of my slide is a portrait of the formerly enslaved Jamaican Francis Barber, who was the valet to Samuel Johnson, and it was painted by Sir Joshua Reynolds. This is one example of a very sympathetic likeness that is so rare today. And because of that rarity and the limitations, this poses serious problems when sourcing authentic and non-stereotyped historical images from the period. And then thirdly, presence. So structural racism within education, particularly within UK higher education and the culture sector, impacts heavily on the type, the volume and the diversity of knowledge published about enslavement. Therefore, the voices, the perspectives and the presence of people of colour is of paramount significance at every stage of the design and the delivery of heritage initiatives particularly initiatives that are addressing enslavement history. We have to be present, otherwise it isn't about us or for us. So to navigate through and to negotiate these complexities, I often apply the Inspiring Learning for All framework to help me devise a project's content and its creative learning activities. For those of you who already know a lot about Inspiring Learning for All, I've also put on this slide some examples of selected research resources that can help you engage in enslavement history research for the first time. So for those of you who don't know about Inspiring Learning for All, the schematic on the left shows the generic learning outcomes within the approach. And what it shows is that we have to ensure that alongside conveying knowledge and understanding and imparting skills, it's also important for young people to be given opportunities to be inspired, to be creative, to examine their attitudes and values, to change their behavior and importantly also to make progression. So over the three workshops, my introductory talks and the slides that I used were designed to take the young people on a journey over time and through space, traversing the Atlantic. And with inspiring learning for all in mind, these were some of the key themes that I introduced. So each 10 minute presentation catalyzed a discussion and what it was designed to do was to encourage creative responses to enslavement history, 
expressed with sensitivity through poetry, through music, and also through the visual arts. Content-wise, the sessions traced and contextualized Britain's involvement in the transatlantic slave trade from the 1500s through to the 1900s, ensuring that histories and geographies of resistance and rebellion led by enslaved Africans featured prominently throughout the narratives. The next set of slides are going to go through some of the stimulus material that I used, always linking back to the 18th century mahogany staircase that was constructed in around 1727, 1728. The mahogany that was used to build the staircase was carved from uh, hardwoods harvested in Central America near the Gulf of Honduras in what was formerly British Honduras, but today is called Belize. And so alongside the presence of the staircase itself and using the staircase to talk about mahogany and taking the young people on a journey through time and space, I used maps and I used portraiture to introduce the story of enslavement history. So beginning with 16th century maps and then portraiture like this of some of the key slavers and their funders, I introduced the topic. And what you can see on screen here are two portraits in the National Portrait Gallery of John Hawkins and Queen Elizabeth I. And this type of imagery conveyed the political and the economic significance of Britain's involvement in the transatlantic slave trade. John Hawkins' first voyage to Sierra Leone took place in 1562. And at that time, his initial purchase of 300 African captives began Britain's involvement in the transatlantic slave, slave trade. During four voyages that decade, he trafficked and transported 1,200 enslaved Africans sold to Spanish planters in the Americas. And for comparison, when Marble Hill was built in the 18th century, British slave traders by then were transporting more than 42,000 people every year. Additionally, showing photographs of Elmina Castle in Ghana and other imagery from West Africa, including the doorway of no return at that particular site, provided the visual reference points for discussing the traumas and the brutalities of capture, family separation, punishments and imprisonments. Careful use of key terminology, such as the Swahili term, the Martha, which means the great catastrophe, express the enormity and the extent of transatlantic enslavement as a crime against humanity. And this also served to add poignancy alongside sharing the statistics about slave voyages over 500 years. Personal narratives written by formerly enslaved Africans who had endured and survived the Middle Passage were also discussed, including key details and the frontispiece image from the 18th century autobiography of Alada Equiano. This enabled young learners to have a direct human connection to the historical information that otherwise featured data and charts documenting mass human suffering that was just too depersonalized to engage with in empathetic and effective emotional ways. I made a deliberate decision not to show figurative images of human suffering and acts of physical violence, including not showing the ubiquitous 18th century illustration of the Brooks slave ship. Instead, the harrowing information was covered textually using extracts of first-hand accounts from enslavement narratives, using poetic verse, and also contemporary visual symbolism created by artists, many of whom were artists with African and Caribbean heritage. My approach to this is based on expert scholarship about the trauma of seeing racialized controlling images. And the type of research that I consulted for that work, amongst others, was work by black feminist theorists such as Patricia Hill Collins, Carol E. Henderson, and importantly, Bell Hooks. So for example, in the book, Black Looks, Race and Representation, 
Bell Hooks writes very powerfully within her chapter, Eating the Other, about black bodies as, quote, historically the most desired for labor in slavery, unquote. And within the context of contemporary racism, she goes on to discuss the continuities of black corporeality being, quote, represented most graphically as the body in pain, end quote. So this kind of image that you can see on screen of the underwater sculpture Vicissitudes by Jason DeCares Taylor, who's a British artist and an environmentalist, helped to discuss the scale of the trauma of lives lost at sea during the enslavement era, even though Jason's artwork was not originally intended to commemorate enslavement. The sculpture's location off the coast of Grenada and its associated links to environmentalism were symbolisms that aligned appropriately with the project's themes. And that group of stone statues of young people holding hands from all parts of the globe was also important for the young people who were participating in our project to see as well. So in the first presentation, I concluded with a focus on resistance and rebellion using historical and contemporary representations of key resistance leaders to foreground the significance of Black-led uprising in the struggle for emancipation. So in addition to Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian Revolution, some of the images you can see on screen, I also mentioned other key freedom fighters, including Taki in Jamaica in the 1760s, Busser's Rebellion in Barbados in 1816, Sam Sharp's Rebellion, the Christmas Rebellion of 1831 in Jamaica, to illustrate the scale of organized resistance spanning many centuries. And then showing these lyrics and playing Bob Marley's redemption song brought that first workshop presentation to a close. And from the feedback that I received, not only from my colleagues, but also from the participants and their youth workers, they found it a calming and contemplative point of reflection on very challenging and difficult history. It was a pause moment before we then moved on to complete a rotation of one-to-one -one learning activities, such as writing acrostic poems, sketching, drafting storyboards, doing clay molding, and also eventually planting a tree in the gardens at Marble Hill. And we might talk a little bit more about that during the Q&A. And then beyond the physical presence of mahogany that were felled by enslaved Africans in the Americas, enslavement generated wealth was also an important aspect of the narrative. So right at the start of the second workshop, I talked a lot about Henrietta Howard and her fi financial transactions. So with the funds granted to her by King George II, she invested in stocks and shares for two companies that were directly linked to transatlantic slave trading. And those companies were the South Sea Company and the Compagnie des Indies, or the Mississippi Company. And Henrietta's £11,500 investment in the 1700s, which is the equivalent of millions today, paid for the land on which Marble Hill was built, the building work, and also the original fixtures and the fittings. And an agreement between Britain and Spain and other European powers in 1713, known as the Treaty of Utrecht, meant that the British South Sea Company was given a major contract, known as the Asiento de Negros, to supply 144,000 enslaved Africans to work on Spanish controlled plantations in the Americas. This agreement, which was essentially a monopoly, lasted from 1713 through to 1750, enabling Britain to become the biggest transatlantic slave trading nation to the benefit of the South Sea Company and its investors like Henrietta. And then we went on to discuss the history of the mahogany trade. And because it's been discussed in print since the 1670s, there's quite a lot of literature about it that we had to condense into this session. And so what I chose to do was to focus on 
the publications of some elite scholars such as Sir Hans Sloan, who also owned plantations in Jamaica and wrote about mahogany in his natural history books. And if you're also aware that Sir Hans Sloan bequeathed his collection of miscellanies eventually to the nation in 1753, that became the foundation for the creation of the British Museum. So again, this is an example of enslavement finances being imbricated into the very fabric of British cultural life and British heritage. And it was very important for me to put that context in the workshops so that the young people could see that it wasn't just about enslavement labor, it was also how the profits of unfree labor led to extreme wealth and the continuations of prosperity on British soil. Now these images, which are photographs from the 1930s in Belize, helped just to give an impression of the unmechanized forest work that used to take place centuries earlier. However, what they couldn't show and they couldn't really convey to the young people was just how backbreaking, how dangerous, how insanitary and how inhumane enforced slave labor was in the density and the heat of the tropical forest. Enslaved men worked as hunters and surveyors, axemen, cattle hands, loggers and squarers, squarers being the ones that squared off the mahogany before it was transported onto ships and traveled overseas and enslaved women and children also labored as cultivators and domestic workers within this nefarious and exploitative system. And so these photographs help to show just how backbreaking the work is, but it had to be contextualized with discussion as well and giving young people opportunities to pose questions. At the end of the second presentation, the words of British rap artist, poet and author Akala stimulated further discussion about the legacies of enslavement. So for example, in his book Natives, Akala writes, quote, we can see brutality ever so clearly when it wears Japanese or German or Islamic clothes, but when it comes to looking in the mirror at the empire on which the sun never set, the 18th century's premier slave trader, the British Empire, so many of us suddenly become blind, deaf and dumb, unable to see murder as murder." End quote. So there was considerable interest in Akala as a relatable, authoritative voice because of the young men's respect for rap lyricism and also for spoken word as an artistic genre. So in addition to reading from his books, I also played recordings of Akala uh, reciting lyrics and flowing over a beat. And the young people were impressed by that. And it was something that they emulated when they also produced their own creative lyrics. And then in the final workshop, I introduced to the young people a selection of visual artists with African and Caribbean heritage, whose work portfolios reference enslavement, resistance and emancipation history. And all of these artworks were used as stimuli for the participants' own artwork right at the end of the course. Kivathi Donkor's contemporary figura figurations, like this one of Tucson L'Overture, served as an important counter representation to the deliberate historical erasure of Black led resistance and Black agency. So in a way, it was a counter narrative to some of those portraits that I showed right at the top of the uh, presentation. And another set of portraits by Kimathi were these. And again, you can re recognize the two people that I feature right at the top of the conversation about the origins of the British slave trade. The iron nails, uh, which are ship's nails, actually replace the framing now of these two figures. And you can see also on their pinned money and other symbolisms that are featured in Kimathi's work to provoke thought and also critical discussion about Elizabeth I and John Hawkins, but to do it in a way that reinterprets what were originally very grand 16th century portraits of them, like the ones that I showed earlier. 
And what it also reveals when you see the intricacy of the way that Kimathi creates these collages is the hidden underside of Britain's involvement in enslavement, but done so in a way that provokes conversation rather than provoking fear, upset and trauma. And that was the purpose of using visual art to deal with some of these difficult histories. Another artist that I showcased, because we were focusing in on mahogany and hardwoods, was Ronald Moody, a very, very important Commonwealth sculptor from the 20th century. And because Ronald Moody depicts positive representations of black corporeality, this also creates a counter visualization to some of the past negative imagery that I mentioned before that was so well critiqued by bell hooks. And then bringing these images right up to date, work by the contemporary British artist Sonia Barrett, who also has dual Jamaican heritage, was shown to the young people because she regularly uses recycled mahogany furniture in her artwork. So she dismantles tables and the limbs from the tables and the chair frames that she uses are reshaped into human form, again to provoke discussion about enslavement, memory and identity. And as you can see from the wing-backed chair there, she creates these crouched positions so that you can actually talk about issues of trauma using abstract art rather than seeing figurations of human bodies being tortured. And that again was a way of being sensitive to the fact that you were talking with young people about very traumatic subjects. La Jungle by Cuban surrealist Wilfredo Lam was also used in my final workshop to illustrate, illustrate the spiritual and religious symbolism linked to the tropical forests of the Americas. Wilfredo's um, interest in Santeria, which is part of his own Cuban heritage, informed his famous depiction of the hardwood forest. And he always views the forest as a sacred space where our ancestral spirits live on through the trees. So yes, the forests are living in the way that the, the, wood, the, you know, the trees take in carbon dioxide and give out oxygen into the atmosphere, but they are also living in a spiritual sense in the way that he describes and depicts it because of his belief in Santeria. And so to close the third workshop, just like the others, I read an extract of poetry, but this time from the work of British born poet and author Malika Booker. She has Guyanese and Grenadian heritage, so like me, a Caribbean diasporan. And she recently worked with English heritage as a writer in residence, researching enslavement history at other properties, including Brodswick Hall. And so these lines are taken from a commissioned piece that she titled Songs of Mahogany. And if you don't mind, I could just read these lines to you to bring my presentation to a close. Genocide visited here as men labored in the art of such a thing. Speak of mahogany, oh speak of the people of the land who languished in the dark desolate valleys. Look yonder into a vault where their hallowed history is buried by architects of deceit. They buried us in the belly of these ships. Mornings we toiled and toiled, bodies and brooding, timber and cut down. In some ways, the tragedy has a silent crescendo, somewhat operatic, somewhat reminiscent of a dark forest. As a 21st century Caribbean diaspora poet, Malaika's words provided an apt conclusion to the workshops. Her work also exemplified many of the observations that I made during my introduction to this lecture. Archival records promise historical and documentary completeness, but inevitably they occlude, they distort, and they omit vital information about the past lives of those who were not even seen as human beings. And as Professor Saidia Hartman rightly notes, 
much of what the archive contains about enslaved people's lives and also about colonial subjects of color more broadly was compiled and left behind by people whose views were so compromised as to be effectively made up. So therefore archives alone are never sufficient as a foundation for teaching and learning about enslavement links at sites of English heritage. They need to be interrogated and reinterpreted by a diversity of scholars and also by artists and activists and other publics to transform how we as a nation engage with difficult history and importantly, how we center black lives. Through facilitating access to black led interpretation through text, through imagery and through presence, including my presence as a teacher on this course, this project, I believe, did successfully give young participants a more nuanced and inclusive learning experience. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you found it helpful. And if people do want to follow on from this uh, session, please do contact me via my web space museum geographies if we don't have an opportunity to go through all the questions that people might have at the end of the discussion. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much, Dr. Carol Anderson. That was absolutely fascinating. And it really has been a joy to work with you on the From All Angles project because you've just brought a real wealth of information and also kind of being able to explore things through artistry and the spoken word really made a huge difference to those young people. Um, but it's lovely to be able to hear you talk about it um, and talk about the ways in which you approach that uh, teaching. And indeed, those young people approach that learning. So Thank you so much for, for the, your talk today. The first question I've got from the, uh, from the group is around that archive. But why, why is that so important to you? So much of our historical knowledge is based on the written documented archive. It's, it's the tangible evidence that we have of our past lives. And so if the information in that archive distorts lives or omits certain lives, it's very, very important because those lies don't get remembered and they don't get remembered in appropriate ways. So as someone who is a scholar of colour, interrogating archives on a daily basis, they are crucial documents, but they are not the be all and end all. Um, it's as though they have a lacuna. There's, there are gaps in the archives. So you have to find ways of trying to recover and restore that lost history. And that is the process of the, the archival scholar. You don't have to be a historian. As I said to you, Rachel, I'm a geographer. You know I'm a geographer. The audience now know that I am. And through cultural geography, I interrogate the archive just like a historian would, interrogating primary sources. But I don't always accept it as universal truth because I know that there are gaps, there are erasures, there are omissions, and there are distortions. And so therefore it's my job because of the reading and the second, secondary literature that I have done, and I apply to that interrogation, to read against the grain of the archive, to uncover the hidden meaning, to triangulate information, not just relying on one source, but relying on several sources to piece together hidden information. And importantly, and I mentioned Saidia Hartman there, Professor Saidia Hartman's approach, uh, which is known as critical fabulation, the way in which she uses speculative fiction to fill the gaps that the archive leaves out, um, is something that I now draw strength on when I'm doing my um, continuation postdoctoral research about black interiority, black vulnerability, and those interior lives of people of African descent that are not documented in the British archives. I hope that explains your, que your question. Yeah, completely. And I think, you know, kind of there's lots of work to be done around that. At the moment, we've got someone uh, called Hannah, who is finding out through a PhD at Hull, King around Mahogany, and understanding a bit more in Marble Hill, and also in Kenwood House as part of some EH funding. So kind of, it's as you say, it's about finding out about those omissions. It's great that we've got people around like you and Hannah to be able to do that um, in more depth. So thank you. 
I've got a question from the floor um, uh, from someone saying that uh, they've done their own reading around the East India Company um, and how they effectively colonised India um, and had their own internal slave system. She's asked whether Henrietta Howard um, invested in this company and was Marble Hill House also funded by the exploitation of the Indian people? To my knowledge, no. And this is the reason why I did cite in my uh, presentation the two companies that I know definitively that she did invest in with that money from King George II. So to my knowledge, no. But I think you make a very good point in your question about the East India Company and other companies that people had uh, tangential or direct links in as investors in their stocks and shares. And it also brings us to other institutional powers as well, like the Bank of England and those other kinds of links to enslavement generated wealth and to um, and to other companies like insurance companies Lloyds of London being another case in point there are so many of these organizations that are all, almost the foundational pillars of British financial success uh, and the legacies of those companies and the fact that they are so uh, important uh, in our history today um, is something that we have to be very mindful of I must also commend uh, Dr. Miranda Kaufman, who's done a lot of research about these companies and their financial links to the transatlantic slave trade. And I would encourage anyone to go and read a lot of the research that Miranda has done, uncovering the types of links, not just proprietary links in terms of investment in enslavement plantations in the colonies, but also these links to these pillar institutions within British cultural life. And I would uh, certainly signpost that literature that, uh, as, as a historian, Miranda has done, which is highly commended uh, and very authoritative. There are other scholars, and I should also mention uh, Steve Martin, S.I. Martin, that many of you will know from his outstanding work that he has done in museums and galleries in the UK, tracing the legacies of Black British history within institutional space. And again, Steve Martin would be another scholar historian of import that I would recommend as someone to follow up on those questions about the East India Company. Thank you. That's great to have those uh, these extra um, extra reading. Um, thank you, Dr. Caroline. The other thing to also mention in terms of extra reading would be um, a report that was commissioned in November um, 20, uh, 2008, which is part of a project around the, um, the slavery connections of four properties in um, English heritage custodianship, which was Bolsover, Broadsworth Hall, with, uh, Northington Grange, and indeed Marble Hill. So that gives you a little bit more of information about histories of all of these properties and it's well worth um, reading um, if you wanted a bit more information. Um, certainly um, your the, the conversation around those profits of unfree labour led to leading to extreme wealth that you talked about um, um, Carol uh, really kind of um, just share about that within that um, that report um, but I thought what was wonderful was when when we were working with you you were talking about exploring those um, those traumatic and um, difficult histories around artistry and verse and and helping um, the young people to explore and navigate that um, by being creative could you tell us a little bit more Yes, um, because a lot of the research that I do is so connected to visual analysis of artworks and artifacts, I wanted to bring that into the, um, the workshop space and allow the young people to explore and uh, get to grips with some of the issues that art can bring out. And it was absolutely wonderful to see them uh, come to life and be animated through creative expression, not only through the visual arts, but also in poetic verse and also through rap lyricism as well. And it was important because so often when you are trying to create what I would term a safe space for dialogue about difficult history in the same way that one might try to do for Holocaust histories, you have to do it in a way that is accessible but you should also do it in a way that is sensitive to the emotional and interior needs of young people. So you can't traumatize if you want someone to be educated and to learn. And so that is the, way, the reason why I used the visual arts and literary arts as almost a filter, not hiding from the information, but using it as a conduit to learning 
in a way that didn't traumatize or re-traumatize those who were the recipients of that learning process. So that's the reason why it's so important. And a lot of people will say to me, well, why are you showing the modernist surrealist art or contemporary abstract um, art uh, as if to say young people aren't capable of taking in the complexities of those artworks. And you know from the way that I taught it, Rachel, I believe that young people are exactly open to all of these complexities as long as you provide uh, a space that allows them to ask questions, to really interrogate the art, to touch and feel it if you've got artifacts and if you've got replicas, to show images of it like the ones that I showed of Wilfredo Lam. And by doing so, you're respecting their intellect and not, um, you know, having negative or lower expectations of what they can achieve. These were at risk young men who have been, some of whom have experienced exclusion from school. And yet it was important for me to have as high expectations of their learning outcomes as I have when I'm teaching in a mainstream setting. And that's the reason why I use the power of creative visual arts to convey information, but also to open up a dialogue and provide that safe space. I think you certainly did that. And I think a, a real moment, that, that pause moment was um, listening to Redemption Song with, with them in the room. I think there was a real moment of, of, of listening, really listening with those words as well. Um, and it was a very powerful moment, certainly for, for me and I, I felt for all of the people within the room. So thank you for bringing that to, um, to that group. I, I, there's um, some thanks uh, from uh, the, the chat so thank you for, for joining us um, uh, but I just wanted to ask a, a last question um, uh, which is you talked about lots of those lovely bits of art um, but what is your favourite? Out of all the ones that I showed um, in the lecture the one that really touches my heart more than any other is the artwork of Wilfredo Lam. As a Cuban surrealist, and he was actually part of Pablo Picasso's circle of artists in the 1930s, he, did, he spent a lot of time in Paris. Um, Rifredo, when he created La Jungla in 1943, he not only conveyed the beauty of our tropical rainforests at a time when people weren't talking about climate agendas and talking about the, um, the sanctity of the forest and why we need to protect them. He created these beautiful artworks. And not only did he touch on environmentalism, but he also touched on spirituality. And spirituality is something that people don't often talk about when we're talking about histories like enslavement history, but it was so important, not only to enslaved Africans' lives, uh, but to the afterlives of those uh, who have followed on from that legacy, people from the diaspora, like my own people from my own heritage as Caribbean diasporans. And the spiritual side, understanding about Caribbean social and religious history through um, the practices of Santeria or Obia and other religious practices that are hybrid religious practices is so important. And Wilfredo Lam encapsulates that beautifully in those um, modernist surrealist works like La Jungla. So that one is my absolute favorite. And I, I did try and bring down some examples of um, key texts of just take things from my um, from my bookshelf just to hold up. There are lots and lots of um, catalogue books about the portfolio of Wilfredo Lam, if people aren't familiar with his work. And it is a source of joy to actually go to some of these catalogues and look through other surrealist pieces like La Jungla to inform what we now know about um, Caribbean diaspora social and religious history alongside learning about enslavement history, its legacies and its afterlives. Definitely a favourite of mine too and, uh, and thank you for, for bringing that piece particularly to life as well. Um, we are so grateful for you bringing your expertise and talents to Marble Hill and indeed to this evening's talk. Um, it was a, a really very fabulous um, set of workshops that we uh, were involved in um, together and um, so grateful for your input. If you would like to see um, the two uh, cherry trees that um, Dr. Carol Ann Dixon talked about that were planted by the young people, they are just by our kitchen garden.
and they are dedicated to the unfree labour um, uh, that were, was involved in Marble Hill. So please do come and visit um, to see those beautiful cherry trees that have borne fruit and uh, wonderful blossom thus far. And we continue to hope that that will enable a home for those young people to always return to and remember their experiences at Marble Hill. But thank you this evening, uh, Dr. Carol and Dixon, we are so, so grateful. And, uh, and we look forward to uh, sharing more about, um, uh, about all of the, this um, history when we open our house um, in April in the spring. So um, we look forward to seeing you there and thank you for your involvement in the reinterpretation process. Take care, thank you for joining us everyone. Good night. <laughs>